whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no hollow, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink, thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own, into our house enter thou not, through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps and Peepers. Woohoo! I'm Dan. Hi, I'm Lindsay. Hope you're watching or, or listening in a in a dark and eerie place. I'm so scared for this week because I know that you're already freaked out. Yeah, I got a little freaked out. I'll, I'll explain why I'm freaked out um, after the stories, why they uh, bothered me a little more than normal this week. Yeah, I'm wearing a little extra protection. Uh, fans of the show, Rich and Laura Desmond sent me this sage necklace. So I'm feeling like I'm extra protected nice. this week. It's a cool looking necklace. Uh huh. Not not normally uh, one for crystally things. That's nice. It's, it's subdued. Dude, it's a small crystal. I like it. Don't start with the crystals. <laughs> uh, thanks for subscribing on YouTube and, and all the ratings and reviews as well. Yeah, yeah we, we appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and again, you know, the reason that we need that just to keep, you know, reminding you guys of why that's important is because that's how other people find us. So if you're enjoying this and you want other people to enjoy it, please rate and review the podcast. And of course, share it with all of your friends. Mm -hmm. And we're glad that the uh, Creeps and Peepers nicknames have stuck. Yes. No feedback that those were taken by any other place. So we got the Creeps who can't get enough of horror. And we got the Peepers who hate horror and love it. That's it's me. Scares the hell out of them. But you keep coming back for more. Yep. And you're coming back for more this week. Yeah. Well, I don't think I have a choice in the matter anymore. You're in. I'm in. You're That's in. It. I mean, I know you've offered to replace me. <laughs> but. <laughs> only, only for your mental health. I'm okay. I know. I know. I know. Today. Uh, got two claimed to be true, possibly uh, paranormal tales today. We'll tell our first mysterious disappearance story. Uh. Dive into the creepy history of Vermont's Bennington Triangle, which I had never heard of. I already don't like it because, you know, I'm afraid of aliens, and that's what disappearances make me think immediately. Okay. Well, you'll probably be thinking that today, and you might be uh, afraid to go into the woods. Oh, great. So we're never going camping again. Got it. <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, we have over, uh, or where have over uh, 30 people gone since the uh, 1940s. Uh, and then we head to primarily Colorado to look into the possibly cursed, probably haunted Harold the Doll. Uh, lots of paranormal speculation surrounding this tiny, chills inducing doll. Very creepy doll. Is it cursed? Is it a spirit or perhaps several spirits trapped inside of this thing? Has the doll actually killed people? Do you see the doll behind you? Oh my God, don't, I know, I, I know, I don't want to look at it right now. I don't want to think about it. This is the story that bothers me. Oh God, great. Also looking forward, if that, if that thing, if you see that, I'm going to get the fuck out of this room. I, uh, yeah. You're going to GTFO? I'm, I'm a little spooked about the, I've never, as a kid, just never cared for him. Um, okay. So yes, Ooh. The, the, this one this is the one that really bothered me this week. Is that why you wanted me to sleep on the couch upstairs last night? Maybe. <laughs> Uh, also looking forward to some of your uh, horror tales that Lindsay will be telling me at the end of the show. I have a really good one this week. I'm super excited from our fan, Frankie. Creeps and peepers, keep sending those stories in your personal tales of horror to uh, my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. And if you have anything else you want to share with us, sometimes uh, we also have like a really cool message that we got from someone this week. So if you have anything that is not a story that you want to share with us, info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. And that comes directly to me. All right. You ready to get started? Okay. Let me get my blankie. Get, get protected. Got, I've get got protected. Le leopard socks on today. Cute. Thank mm -hmm. you. They felt thematic with my kind of like 80s, 90s outfit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. <laughs> Very stranger things. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. <sighs> okay, get in a good space. I'm good. I'm good. I got my coffee and I got my special drink cup from our friend Gary Howard. I'm ready. Time now for the tale of the Bennington Triangle. You've most likely heard of the Bermuda Triangle, but have you heard of Vermont's Bennington Triangle? Since the 1940s, the woods inside this landlocked triangle have swallowed up roughly 40 people. No sign has been left regarding to what happened to them. In all but a handful of cases, no remains have ever been found. Okay. No evidence of foul play. Out-of-town explorers and locals alike have just vanished without a trace, never to be seen again. Okay. People who, for unknown reasons, disappeared forever when the forest or something inside of the forest seems to have just taken them. 
The borders of the Bennington Triangle aren't clearly defined. It's thought to be centered at Glatzenberry Mountain. And uh, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, Vermont people. <laughs> uh, surrounding in the surrounding towns, which include Bennington, Woodford, Shaftesbury, and Somerset. Uh, Somerset. Bennington sits uh, near where Vermont, New York, and Massachusetts all intersect. Quaint, small city of just over 15,000 people with a picturesque little historic downtown from the mid-19th century. Very cute. Complete with a, a cobbler, a barber shop, a chocolatier, a live theater, local little bookshop. Very Vermont. Toy stores, music shops, art shops, museum, galleries, and more. And Bennington is surrounded by mountains and the thick, dark forests that cover them. The massive Green Mountain National Forest, more than 400,000 undeveloped acres of timber, sits to the northeast, one of only two national forests in all of New England, thick with aspen and birch trees and various types of pine, spruce and fir and white and red pine. There is home to moose, black bears, coyotes, and possibly creatures that defy explanation or classification. No, thank you. The famous Appalachian Trail cuts through this forest, and Glastonbury Mountain Seemingly the epicenter of the Bennington Triangle disappearances sits inside this park as well. And while many naturalists and nature enthusiasts love this area for its scenic, well-maintained trails, postcard-like vistas, wildlife, cold, clear lakes, creeks, and rugged beauty, others will not set foot in this land. That's me. I'm not going there. According to local American Indian folklore, the land where the four winds meet has been cursed for centuries. There are tales of a stone atop the mountain that swallows men whole if they dare set foot upon it. Their body and souls banished forever to some other realm of existence. There are parts of this forest where tribes haven't or you know wouldn't set foot for sent in, inside of it for centuries. The tribes told tales of wild, man-like beasts that would kill anyone who dared to enter their haunted land. And then in 1945, a five-year span of disappearances began in the Bennington Triangle that got paranormal enthusiasts worldwide speculating about the area, and the speculation hasn't stopped. It all started with the vanishing of Mitty Rivers. Mitty was a 74-year-old local hunting guide, and he'd led a party of four hunters around the area of Hell Hollow in the southwest woods of Glastonbury before he suddenly and inexplicably disappeared. After an unsuccessful initial search, many still held out hope that this knowledgeable woodsman was still alive. Locals half expected him to suddenly walk back into town, but he never did. Nope. Soon, more than 300 concerned locals and U.S. Army soldiers dispatched from the Massachusetts Fort Devens combed through the vast wilderness for eight straight days, and they didn't turn up a single shred of evidence as to his whereabouts. Weird. No one knows to this day what happened to him. The woods just took him. But How? The following year, an 18-year-old student at Bennington College, Paula Weldon, disappeared just as completely. Weldon had decided to hike a leg of the popular long trail during Thanksgiving break when most of her classmates had already returned home for the holiday. She was last seen on Sunday, December 1st, 1946, when she'd worked her usual lunch shift at the school's dining hall. Later that afternoon, she put on a red parka and jeans and left her dormitory for the great outdoors. She stepped under the long trail near Glatzenbury Mountain, and then she was just gone. She never showed up for her Monday classes, spurring a massive search party of more than a thousand people. Her father put out a reward for information leading to her whereabouts of $5,000, a considerable sum of money at the time. Despite the large turnout in the reward, despite numerous aircrafts combing the skies searching for her, despite a variety of uh, uh, assisting law enforcement departments from multiple states all working together to find her, no clue whatsoever to her fate was ever uncovered. Where the fuck is she? No one knows what happened to her in those woods. Her, re her case remains open to this day over 70 years later. Wow. Exactly three years to the day after Paula Weldon vanished, an even more mysterious and I think much more disturbing disappearance occurred in the Bennington Triangle. On December 1st, 1949, a 68-year-old man named James E. Tedford boarded a bus to Bennington after visiting relatives in St. Albans, Vermont, 150 miles due north. Numerous eyewitnesses, including the driver of the bus, later confirmed that Tedford had been in his seat as late as the very last stop before Bennington. Yet, when the bus pulled into Bennington, he was gone. What? He had somehow impossibly vanished into thin air while inside the bus, no while way. the bus was moving through the Bennington Triangle. No fucking way. 
Multiple people remembered him being on the bus after his last stop before Bennington. Baffled passengers noted that Tedford's luggage and an open bus timetable remained on his seat. What? He was holding the timetable. Suddenly the seat is empty. Just the timetable is there. Fuck that. If the witnesses were correct, Tedford would have disappeared from his seat again while the bus was traveling down Route 7 while it was driving through the Bennington Triangle. Never going there. No clue as to anything that happened to him. No remains. Nothing has ever been found. Nearly a year later, in mid-October 1950, the woods took another life. Eight-year-old Paul Jepson went missing. The little boy was last seen happily playing near his family's pickup truck uh, by his mother, who had left him to tend to some pigs at the dump where she and her husband were caretakers, and they never saw him again, nor did anyone else. In addition to law enforcement and the hundreds of volunteers who assembled to form a search party to find him, a New Hampshire sheriff brought in bloodhounds to sniff out for the missing boy. The dogs were able to pick up his scent. Okay. And then just suddenly and abruptly lost his trail as if he had evaporated into thin air. What the fuck? Long after his son vanished, young Paul's father told the Albany Times Union that it was perhaps, quote, the lure of the mountains that had pulled in his missing son. He said that Paul had strangely talked of nothing but the mountain in the days prior to his disappearance. What? Why? What wanted him there? Oh, my God. Two weeks later, another person went missing. The only one of these five in this little time frame whose body would later be found. Okay, okay. In mid-December 1949, 53-year-old Frida Langer, an experienced hiker and survivalist familiar with the area, also went missing from the Long Trail, bordering Glastonbury. After hiking a brief half mile with her cousin, Langer fell into a stream, set off back to camp to change her clothes, where her husband was resting with a hurt knee. But neither her husband nor her cousin ever saw her again. Shit. Not alive. Helicopters from the Connecticut Coast Guard and U.S. Army in Massachusetts, as well as local aircraft from Citizens and the Vermont Aeronautics Commission, all helped search for Langer. As many as 400 people, including the Massachusetts National Guard, even meticulously searched the surrounding areas, and initially they found absolutely nothing. Then six months after she went missing, Langer's corpse was found near the Somerset Reservoir. Curiously, it was an open area that had been searched extensively numerous times immediately following her disappearance. Weird. What happened to her? Why didn't they find her sooner? No one knows. Her body, by the time it was found, had decayed so badly that the cause of death could never be determined. Many, many other strange occurrences have gone on in these woods, not just disappearances. In 1892, a sawmill worker, Henry McDowell, bludgeoned a co-worker to death randomly with a rock. What? After he heard, claimed he heard voices coming from the trees urging him to attack. He was committed to an insane asylum, managed to escape from the asylum, vanished into the woods, never seen again. <gasps> Five years after that murder, a prominent local citizen named James, or named John Harbor headed out just south of Glastonbury to hunt, and he was later found shot dead with his fully loaded gun laying next to him. Strangely, someone or something had dragged him several yards after he had been shot and propped up his body, set the gun next to him. Those who investigated his death were left wondering why he was so easily shot when he had a fully loaded gun. Right. Why would his assailant bother to set the gun next to him after moving the body? Right. His murder has never been solved. Of course not. Numerous hikers and hunters have seen and heard unexplainable shapes and sounds in the forest for years. Many have spotted odd lights in the sky. Not satellites, not planes, mm -hmm. not stars or planets or anything that could identify. Truly UFOs in the sense that while maybe not extraterrestrial, definitely unidentified. Is that what has been taking people from this forest? Aliens. Why have they been taking people from this forest? Voices have been heard by more than just that one man back in 1892 on dead air FM bandwidths. What? Quote, terrifying voices have been picked up numerous times. <gasps> No one thus far can figure out what the voices are saying. Eer. Maybe eeriest of all, strange shadows have been spotted in the forest. Humanoid shapes moving between the trees. What are they? What do they want? The cryptid Bennington Monster has even been blamed for disappearances. The first reported sighting of the Bennington Monster took place early in the 19th century. A stagecoach full of passengers was traveling near the Glastonbury area when the driver was forced to stop due to a washed out road. This is when the driver noticed a large footprint in the mud, which didn't appear to be human. And that's when a large creature, humanoid but much bigger than a man, supposedly attacked the coach, knocked it over with several blows. The passengers, multiple passengers, reported seeing a pair of eyes staring at them from the dark, and then they heard something roar and rush off into the darkness. 
What exactly, if anything, did those people see? Is the land of the Bennington Triangle really cursed? What's out there in the woods Something of southwestern Vermont? If you've ever spent time way out in those or any other woods, you know the woods are mysterious and at night they can be a truly frightening place. A darkness you don't understand if you've only lived in a city. What lies out in the woods at night beyond the beam of your flashlight? What could be standing right next to you? Something you could feel but not see if that flashlight were to go out. Fuck you. What waits for you under the moonlight? My God, stop. Ghosts, aliens, living shadows. What if some monsters are real? And what if some of those monsters prowl the woods to this day in the Bennington Triangle? What if others uh, prowl your neck of the woods? Well, thanks for that, because our house butts up to fucking woods. <laughs> Asshole. <laughs> Fuck you. I meant to say what other monsters at the end, too. I don't I'm care <laughs> what you meant to say. We all knew what you meant to say. And I do want to say it's the Appalachian Trail. No, it's Appalachian. I've been corrected many times. Appalachian? Mm-hmm. That's, I, that, that's I the regional. I grew up in Ohio. Well, I, I have um, Appalachia. And so if it, like, every time oh. every time on my uh, on the other podcast time, this is why I'm saying this, <laughs> when I used to say uh, Appalachian, oh boy. Really? A lot of, lot of backlash from the from the regional Appalachian folk. No. I wonder, so that, that's I wonder why if I said it's it that way. colloquial to I, where... I bet, I bet. Okay. People can be real territorial about their uh, phrases. I get, it. I get it. I mean, I grew up in Cuyahoga County and people call it like Cuyahoga. I'm like, that's not it. I think it's, yeah, one yeah. of those things. Okay. Let's talk about this. Yeah. Chills the whole fucking time. I, yeah, you don't like disappearances. I don't because there's no reason for it to happen. Like, like if we've got a murderer, mm-hmm. I, okay, that person did it to that person right if we have a possession even though i can't see the spirit other people are seeing it happen but it's like people are just fucking poof. right and and you know you said murderer i mean you know that's one of the uh the theories or was briefly they're like what if it was wonder. a serial killer but but people don't so think spread so, out exactly uh, so spread out and and the um uh you know normally serial killers have a a certain type that they're after they're after right. women between these right. ages this is all over the map you know right. uh child adult man well, woman. And not not consistent in, to me like not enough murders or deaths or disappearances yeah. in a row right where it's like i mean what would you say like oh one year it was this kind of yeah. dude and then this year it was that kind of kid and like, the bloodhounds probably would have found the remains you know like and that, that's right. what's weird to me the remains is that you know they had search parties big search parties go out in the woods right after these people disappeared yeah. and not a scrap of clothing like nothing nothing nothing, nothing not it's like one they, they just vanished hair. Nothing. Right, right. No DNA. If it was an animal or something like that. Right. You would have like shreds of body or something. Right, exactly. There's, I mean, in f- full disclosure, there's another theory that there was a lot of mining done. Okay. I mean, not a lot, but some mining down the mountain, you know, like, you know, with tunnels and some pits. And like, you know, what if these people kind of fell into mine shafts? But then I think, yeah, but the but, people searching knew about the mine shafts. Right, and they would search the mine shafts. It's not like you would just ignore those. Exactly. Well, also... I think about uh, you said something about the reservoir. Mm-hmm. They found the one, one body. Yeah, one, one body. body there. How big? How deep? How wide is the reservoir? Have they really like combed the bottom? I would. I, I, mean, think, I would think so. I think so. I mean, I mean, even even back in the forties. I mean, you know, uh, professional divers and things for like search and right. rescue teams can do a pretty thorough job. And and there's no notation. It, it's not like the reservoir. I mean, I don't know exactly how deep it is, sure. but I know that when um, lakes or reservoirs are especially deep, mm-hmm. there's some kind of notation of that. Like like where we live, you know, Lake Ponderé is an especially oh, deep yeah. lake. Yeah. Where they've done like submarine testing and things. There, you, there's no notation of that with this lake. It's not like it's an especially deep. Do you think there's bodies at the bottom of Lake Ponderé? Probably. That's not the answer I was expecting. <laughs> I mean, it's really deep. Oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah, I just don't like... Uh, okay, so obviously just the like the mass disappearance of the... Or the, yeah. the complete and pure disappearance of them with zero trace. That freaks me out. Mm-hmm. That little boy, the mountains are calling. I know, weird, right? What? Yeah, why would dad say that? Like, you're just thinking about these these mountains, like like the, the lure of the mountains. Yeah, like, what the fuck is that? Yeah, what does that even mean? Kind of freaks me out because Kyler loves to hike. Yeah. And I was thinking about 
you know, we've talked about doing like a huge family road trip. I'm like, well, that's fucking not on the list. <laughs> and as a kid, even though I grew up super poor, we had friends who had a really lovely house in Nantucket. And so when I, you said Somerset, there was Somerset Beach in Nantucket. Right. And then you were explaining this quaint little town. I mean, I was envisioning yeah. Nantucket in the worst way. And I was like, oh my God, please don't be in Nantucket. Please, please, uh, please don't take us there. <laughs> don't ruin it. I feel like this is one of those stories that I might, you know, forget about for a while, you know, like soon. But then like, you know, because we will go camping again. Well, I'm doing that thing with Monroe this next summer, like a special little like uh, overnight on the mountain trip. That's when I'll think of it. Oh, I'll, I'll be fuck. I'll be laying in a tent in the middle of the night, away from everybody, and be like, "Oh God!" Like I'll if be I see sure a light, or you. oh yeah, I bet. Wait, and also, like, I got an email from a fan this week that ended up at info instead of my story, yeah. or maybe it was in the my story, whatever. And he and his girlfriend were camping, okay, and saw like a light. Eek. And they would camp during the week because they worked in the food industry, so they couldn't, you know, go on the weekends, and so there were no mm-hmm. people around, and it just. I was thinking about that. Like, what happens if you're camping and you think you see something? There is no one else fucking around. I know, that's what makes it scary. I mean, I mean, that's what makes it scary with a story like this, where it's like, you know, you can go to your bland, uh, go in your, into your head and be like, well, come on. Almost everybody does come back from the woods. Like 99.9999%. The odds are very low. But when you're out there by yourself, that's yeah. not always that comforting because this, one of the scariest parts about the woods... A, I mean, I can't emphasize enough how dark it is. And I, I remember, I like, I grew up in a very rural place. And I remember one time, after not having been home for a while, driving back home where there's no street lights, mm-hmm. and, and I was like, fuck, in, the, in this canyon, the Salmon River Canyon, I was like, holy shit, it is dark. Yeah, oh, like, every time, cra- like, 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 oppressively dark when it's overcast. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. yeah. I know like when we go to like your mom and your grandparents, right? They they live thirty minutes apart, and we mm-hmm. have to drive through the mm-hmm. canyon, and it's yeah. like. I don't even know how you fucking see deer. I'm surprised we have not hit 17,000 deer at this point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's so fucking dark. And all you can see is like beady eyes, mm-hmm. maybe if you're lucky. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially when it's not a full moon. Yeah, like again, like when there's the clouds. So let, uh, just to give uh, uh, the people watching on YouTube, yeah, yeah. Uh, this first picture, this is just, this is just to, to give you an idea of how thick the forest is. It's so beautiful. It, it really is. I mean, gorgeous. Gorgeous. Because it's a, it's a mixture of deciduous trees and, uh, and then pine trees. It's really pretty. Deciduous? Pr- I think so. Is that the one where the leaves fall? Oh, I, I didn't know what that meant. I, I, I'm pulling that out of my ass. Okay, good that's for not, you. But I think that's what it is. But anyway, it's cool. like hardwoods and pine, which we don't have okay. really uh, a comparable forest to here in the Northwest. Got it, got it. And okay. I've driven through the uh, New England years ago in the fall, and it really is so pretty. Did you drive through the Triangle? Mm, I don't think so, actually. D- looking good. where it is on the map, no. I don't it's think good. I've ever so driven really, through the area. So no. it's really you, not some other alien form of you. <laughs> right. Phew. So here's the mountain. This next picture is Glastonbury Mountain, just in the distance there. Okay. Uh, Again, I mean, so beautiful. Very scenic, very thick, lush forests. I don't feel scared. Uh, but going to be different at night. And then this next picture is, this is one of the dis- uh, people who disappeared. This is that, oh. that college student, Paula Jean Weldon, who disappeared. That's sad. Mm-hmm, back in the 40s. And then this next picture, some people think that these guys might be behind everything. Nearby is Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> And I don't know if it's kind of some marketing ploy, but they are, you know, associated with Vermont, and that's their factory in uh, in Waterbury. And you think that they're doing it? It's north. They're north of the uh, of the triangle, but you know, maybe some kind of ice cream experiments or something like getting new flavors. Do you think that like that's what's in people? Chunky Monkey is people? It, it might be Chunky Monkey. It's is not people. bananas. It's like human flesh. Yep, they're just going to come out with a flavor called Soylent Green, mm-hmm. <laughs> just to really <laughs> hiding in plain sight. I mean, Cherry Garcia is my favorite, and if I find <laughs> out that those cherry bits are flesh bits i'm fucked <laughs> there are people taken from the forest Eep. okay so so that's that's our that's our first story i see i scared you more than i thought i forgot how scared you get over disappearances fuck well it also just like the shadows in here so it's like we've got a new thing behind your head that's like a weird creepy face thing oh yeah yeah that our friend amy made us and mm-hmm. then like when you move your shadow moves and it casts a fucking sh- shadow across the doll that's behind you like I'm not in a good place right now. Okay, okay. So well, maybe this next one will be better for you. This is the one that not. really freaked me out. I'll talk probably ab- not. I'm going to be staring at a fucking doll the whole time. Well, oh God. Well, I'll talk. Yeah. I'm going to ignore it. He's winking at me. I swear. No. Nope. Okay. I, I, I'm going to ignore it because this is the one that yeah really got me. I'll talk about it more after the story. <sighs> you ready? Oh God. Okay. Okay. Our second tale today, fairly well known story in the world of haunted objects, and like a lot of popular tales. You know, the more it gets kind of retold, the more the details seem to change and grow. Uh, For this telling, I've synthesized several versions of this account into an amalgam that I think conveys the most consistent and important details in the most entertaining and interesting way. And I I say this for our creeps and peepers. Like in case, you know, you know, you've heard this yarn spun uh, in some other way and you have a moment of like, wait a minute. I thought, yeah, I get it. 
Okay. I get it. There are more, you know, uh, versions of the story. And and that's just kind of the nature the of, nature of these. these stories. But this one in particular okay. stands out because it's just, it's been retold on, you know, some TV st- shows. It's Got been it. It's more investigated than most of the stories we've done here. Okay. 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 So uh, s- saying that, time now for the tale of Harold the Haunted Doll. In 2003, a man named Greg put a doll up for sale on eBay. A doll he called Harold. A doll he claimed was haunted. A doll he claimed had killed his pet and made him sick. A doll he claimed was ruining his life and causing him to lose his mind. The following is a summation of some of the details he posted in his eBay product description. Greg said he purchased a doll in a small dirt lot flea market in the tiny town of Webster, Florida. The Swaparama, 35 acres of strange wares. He arrived at the flea market fairly late in the day when most people were packing to go home. That's when he saw an elderly man placing a tattered doll into a box close to where Greg had parked his car. The doll looked interesting, so Greg asked the man if he could see it. And the conversation went something like this. Man, you don't want to see this doll. Greg, sure I do. What do you want for it? Well, that's a good question, because it's very old. And then the man looked like he was going to start crying, and he said, It was my son's. I bought it for him when he was born, and he passed away a few years after. This doll has sat in my work shed for over 60 years. I wasn't going to bring it out today, but I figured I, I just needed to get it out of here. Anyway, I, I just want 20 bucks for it. Greg then gave the man the 20 bucks, put the doll in a drugstore shopping bag, and then he walked away. And when he was halfway down the aisle towards his car, the man hurried over to him as fast as this elderly man could move, visibly out of breath, and said, I have to warn you about something. I can't just let you take him like this. The reason it has been in my shed is that the doll brought an eerie presence into our house after our son died. We would hear crying, singing out from his bedroom. When we went to check it out, there was nothing, just the doll. Other things started to happen. A priest told me I should burn the doll. I tried, but it would barely burn. Oh. That's why his arms and head and legs are so worn. Anyways, I just had to let you know. And then the man just kind of trailed off, seemingly kind of embarrassed, as if he suddenly realized how crazy everything he had just said aloud, you know, might come across. Greg told him it was all okay. He appreciated the warning. Then the old man smiled a weak smile at him, kind of with sad eyes, eyes that seemed to apologize for what he thought he had just done, eyes full of maybe some tears and and a smile of, was that a smile of relief? Was he glad to have unloaded both the doll and a guilty conscience? He was ridding himself of something he claimed had tormented him, and he didn't have to do it under false pretenses. Greg just kind of chuckled to himself as he walked away, thinking these thoughts. The man still staring at him as he made his way to the car. When he unlocked his door and looked back, the old man's smile seemed to have improved. His stare seemed suddenly almost, was it threatening? Grimly satisfied? It was hard to explain. It just gave Greg the chills. Yeek. Then he laughed again at how silly all of this was. The guy was probably 100 yards away. He could barely see his smile, barely see his eyes. Why was his mind adding all these nefarious details? When Greg got home, he took the doll out of the bag, set it up in his living room and his life quickly changed for the worse. Within hours, he started to think he was hearing the doll whispering, mumbling. Fuck. Sometimes laughing, maybe? He would swear it sounded like someone else was in the house with him. It was like like hearing a quiet conversation in the hotel room next door, or the apartment or office next door. Muffled, but definitely people talking. But then when he would turn off anything making noise in the house and listen intently, he couldn't hear anything. It was maddening. Two days later, his previously very healthy and young cat just suddenly died. Went to sleep, didn't wake up. Fuck that. The vet had no explanation, just told him it was rare, but sometimes it just like, you know, people inexplicably die, so do pets. Yeah, do they? Mm Mm-hmm. Same day, his longtime girlfriend suddenly just up and left him for another guy, seemingly out of nowhere, and he began to suffer from chronic migraines. Uh Uh-huh. All this, and it had only been two days since he purchased a doll. He didn't think a doll could possibly be be behind a breakup, but... You know, uh, the doll gave him a really bad feeling and it creeped him out enough to put it back in the bag and move the doll to the basement. He almost threw it away, but he felt like he just shouldn't do that. Actually, as crazy as it sounded, he felt like for reasons he didn't totally understand that he couldn't do that. That the doll somehow wouldn't let him do that. Get the fucking doll out of there. Greg kept flashing on the way the old man at the flea market had stared at him. What had the man given him? A week later, Greg began to hear the sounds of children laughing and crying. Sounds coming from his basement, sometimes laughter. Jesus. Every time he would go downstairs to check it out, the sounds would stop. And then when he would go back upstairs, they'd start up again. Sometimes they seemed to start back up the second he turned his back to the doll and started to walk back up the stairs. No way. Always the sounds seemed to come from that goddamn doll, Harold. 
Greg then says he put the doll in a small box he called an armadillo coffin okay. in his basement where it, rem- where it would remain for a year and a half. And then now, according to the eBay listing, he wanted to get rid of it. It scared him. Greg writes in the listing that he's come to believe that Harold is cursed. That sometimes when he takes it out of the box, out of his little coffin, it feels like it's alive. Why are you taking it out? Sometimes he swears it feels like it has an actual pulse. Fuck! Greg writes in the listing... Uh, that he, uh, this cursed doll measures 21 inches tall. It's a composition doll, a doll made partially out of composition, a, a composite material composed of sawdust, glue, other materials such as cornstarch, resin, and wood flour. Uh, those kind of dolls started being made in the mid 19th century when this doll was probably created. And if you're basically picturing an old creepy doll in your mind as you hear this story, you're probably picturing a composition doll. After saying that, you know, all sales will be final, Greg puts it all up for auction. Just like the old man before him, he's cleared his conscience and he's ready to pass this dark object on to somebody else. When the auction ends, the winning bidder never makes good on the deal. Greg feels like Harold doesn't want to leave him, which makes him want to get rid of him that much more. Go away, Harold. Greg continues to experience more strange sounds from the basement, more headaches. He puts the doll up for auction a second time. This time, a woman named Kathy puts in the winning bid. And she does make good on the deal and immediately starts to regret it. Shortly after receiving the doll, Kathy begins to experience a series of unfortunate events that she quickly becomes or comes to believe Harold is responsible for. She puts the doll in the trunk of her car, drives it to her aunt's house, who is asked to see it. The idea that this uh, doll could be cursed strikes her aunt as hysterical. Kathy's aunt uh, holds uh, Harold, laughs at how, you know, anyone could think a small raggedy doll that looked like it was going to fall apart at any moment could hurt anyone. And then the following day, her aunt calls Kathy, asking to be picked up at work. Her back has suddenly gone out, and uh-huh. she can't walk. Uh huh. Then Kathy's aunt's husband, his back goes out the same day. Then Kathy's back goes out. Very strange. None of them had a history of back problems. Fuck you, Harold. Two weeks later, Kathy and her fiancé, Rick, had planned to go on a cruise with Kathy's aunt and her husband. Just days before they were supposed to go, Kathy receives a phone call from her aunt. She and her new husband were uh, not going to be able to go on the cruise because they both developed bronchitis, strep throat, and Kathy's aunt had been stricken with shingles. What? Had, Ka- had Kathy's aunt angered Harold by laughing at him. Kathy was starting to really worry about this possibly cursed doll. And then she really began to worry after what happened to her good friend Veronica. Oh, shit. Veronica and her husband, John, liked to travel. And the night before they were to take off for Amsterdam, they came over to Kathy and Rick's house for dinner. Uh, Veronica was a, was a collector of antiques, and she was curious about Harold. She wanted to see it. So she came over. Kathy showed it to her. And she made a comment about what terrible shape the doll was in. Uh-oh. Then she made the mistake of holding it, laughing at it. A few days later, John calls Kathy from Amsterdam and tells her that Veronica is dead. What? Veronica had brought up the doll again, laughed about how ridiculous it was that anyone can think it was cursed as they were having a few drinks. She went out onto the balcony to have a cigarette, promptly fell down the stairs, fractured her skull, died in the hospital from brain injuries. Holy fuck. John was convinced the doll was somehow responsible. He told Kathy to destroy it, but just like Greg before her, for some reason she felt like she couldn't. A year's worth of strange ailments and mishaps follow. And then after what happened to Stephen, at Rick's insistence, Kathy puts Harold up for auction. Finally. Hoping that whomever, you know, this time would uh, know what to do with it, whoever took it. Uh, After Veronica's death, John decided to move back to South Africa. He and Veronica had a boarder named Stephen, who was staying with them and suddenly was now without a home. Kathy and Rick offered him an extra room they had in their house. Kathy was keeping Harold in a shed at that time in the backyard, or at least she thought she was. She'd forgotten that after showing it to Veronica, she'd put the doll in her guest room closet. The closet in the room she was now offering Stephen. Oh, Stephen. This was the same room. Uh, uh, yeah, this is, yeah, Stephen. Stephen had recently had a physical, was given a clean bill of health. Then three months after moving into the room with Harold, he began to have trouble swallowing. He started to lose his voice. When he went back to the doctor to see what was wrong, he was diagnosed with stage four cancer of the larynx. Oh my gosh. Died a few months later. Fuck, Harold. Ha- had Harold killed two people or was it all just a coincidence? Nope. Kathy puts the doll up for sale now on eBay, and this time the doll is, uh, you know, the, the auction is won by a paranormal enthusiast and amateur ghost hunter, Anthony Quintana. Kathy told Anthony everything that had happened around her and that he could back out if he wanted. She was worried for Anthony, but he still accepted the doll. After the doll arrived in the mail, Anthony cut the, or Anthony cut the box open, found Harold wrapped in a Dwayne Reed drugstore bag, 
Anthony scanned the doll with something called a Trifield EMF reader, a device that measures alternating magnetic currents to see if he could detect any anomalous uh, electromagnetic fields coming from the doll. Some believe that these sort of readings can indicate the presence of a ghost, and the meter's needle does not budge. It doesn't even quiver, nothing. Disappointed, and Anthony thinks that maybe he's been scammed. He takes it all out of the bag, puts it on his couch, takes pictures of it, hoping to find some orbs, some type of photographic evidence of something you know not known in this world. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Nothing shows up. Uh, before he throws Harold in the trash, Greg decides to run a few more tests. He knows a woman named April from his ghost hunting adventures, a woman who is claimed to be a psychic, and he decides to have April do a reading on Harold. The two meet in the basement of the Tattered Cover, an independent bookstore in the Cherry Creek neighborhood of Denver, Colorado. Oh, man. Anthony sets Harold on the table. He and April uh, you know, sit at uh, as he sprinkled Harold with holy water. April chuckles, you're using holy water on him? And when, uh, and then April takes Harold into her hands and says, wow, he's in really bad shape. She then turns Harold over in her hands and says, I'm getting something about a spirit in the doll, being a child molester, a molested what? child or both. And then she suddenly starts trembling. Then she starts to cry. She goes pale, turns to Anthony and says, I'm sorry, but I can't do this. He asks her why not. And she says, he just told me he's going to kill me. What? I'm really sorry, April continues, but I have a heart murmur, and I heard Harold say, I'm going to kill you, and then I started to feel as though something was grabbing my heart. Holy shit. Anthony hadn't heard anything. He thought maybe she was just being dramatic. Oh my god. But he did digitally record his meeting with April, and when he gets back home, he decides to listen back to his recording. As he's listening to April chuckling about the holy water, he hears a male voice <gasps> that he did not hear in the room angrily say, shut up! Then when he sprinkles holy water on the doll, he hears an agonized scream that sends chills up and down his spine. When April mentions that she felt that the spirit within the doll was either molested as a child or a child molester or both, he hears what he says can only be described as an angry roar. And then a male voice says, I'm going to kill you, bitch. <sighs> Immediately after hearing this voice, he hears April say, I'm sorry, Anthony, but I can't do this. Anthony suddenly has no doubt he has not been scammed. There is something horribly wrong with the doll he's gotten on eBay. Holy shit. And as a paranormal enthusiast, at first, this makes him very happy. He's excited. This Idiot. is why he got the doll in the first place. Oh, Anthony, you're so dumb. But he's also scared. What is inside this doll? Mm-hmm. A few weeks later, Anthony, who is, of course, talking about what happened, you know, with uh, April to whoever would listen, is asked by a friend named Rachel, who is working as a barista at the Tattered uh, you know, Covers coffee shop, to bring the doll back to the store so she and her friends could see it. Anthony does exactly this, and he notices that Rachel and all of her friends have crystals with them, and uh, they're holding these crystals while they examine the doll. Anthony asks them what the crystals are for, and they say protection. Anthony again digitally records this meeting, and when he plays back the audio later, he hears a male voice again. When the first friend of Rachel's touches him, the first person holding a crystal, God damn it, stop! Oh. Rachel tells him that she thinks some type of spirit is trapped in the doll. She wonders if the spirit has been placed inside the doll through some kind of curse. Now Anthony's getting more and more curious about this doll. He decides to take it to another psychic, you know, have it have it investigated more thoroughly. This psychic, once she sees the doll, refuses to touch it. She also asks Anthony to leave her place saying, I can't help you. Now please go away. Weird. She also refuses to tell Anthony why the doll bothers her so much. She's clearly just visibly terrified. Yeah, yeah. Anthony finds another psychic, a woman named Diane, who did agree to examine the doll. He brings his digital audio recorder again, hoping to catch another electronic voice phenomenon, or EVP. When he takes Harold out of his Dwayne Reed drugstore bag, Diane makes a comment about a molested child. The same thing April had said. Right. Why do you say that, he asked. And Diane says, I don't know. It's just a feeling I get and as she's staring intently at the doll. After Diane examines the doll, Anthony plays back the audio recording. And when it gets to the part where Diane talks about feeling as though the doll harbored a child that had been molested... Uh, she and Anthony both hear a loud, roaring adult male voice say, Fuck you! Holy shit. Then Diane looks down and says, What the fuck? Does this look like a bite to you? <gasps> she holds her hand out to Anthony so he can see what she's talking about. There are two red indentations. It looks like capillaries have been broken uh, between her thumb and forefinger. Anthony finds a fine tip Sharpie pen on a table, grabs some stir sticks he saw on the table, holds one of the sticks up to her hand, marks the edges of the bite on it, with a little, you know, line where the gap is in the middle. Then he holds those markings up to the painted-on teeth of Harold the doll's mouth. Exact match. No fucking way. Anthony and Diane are now both freaked out. The doll has apparently somehow just physically attacked Diane. 
They walked back to her office, ran to two of her uh, co-workers who just had returned from lunch. Diane tells them what had happened, and one of them asks, Diane, what happened to your eye? What? What do you mean, she responds, puzzled, and her co-worker says, it looks like somebody hit you. Sure enough, the area under her left eye was now red and swelling, like she'd been punched. Anthony takes the doll out of the drugstore bag, holds it to the hand up to her face. This is crazy, but the size of the little hand on the doll matches this red bump. No way! I know. It's funny to me, but also like, what the fuck? Uh, it looks like, impossibly, this little doll had somehow hit her. This is what they claim. This is crazy, but Anthony's scared now, also still excited to possess such an obviously haunted object. Oh, Anthony. He now decides to use a Ouija board. Oh, my God. To try to talk to the spirit or the spirits that he believes are firmly, you know, uh, residing inside this doll. He asked Diane if she'll do it with him. Nope. She's had enough. Yeah, she's a genius. He asked other members of his ghost hunting team, and Heather, the newest member of the group, tells him, I'd love to. Oh, Heather, you fucking idiot. Anthony doesn't have a whole lot of experience with the Ouija board, neither does Heather, so they don't do any protection rituals. Of course not. They don't say any prayers to safeguard themselves, they don't turn off the lights, they don't light any candles, they just sit down. Harold, you know, the doll in between them. Harold turns on his digital recorder, they put their fingers on the planchette, uh, ask questions and hope for the best. Is there anyone here? He asks. Y. E. S. Are you the one trapped in the doll? Y. E. S. Is your name Harold? N. O. What is your name? A. H. M. E. D. And then the board refuses to answer any more of their questions. Anthony then checks for EVPs. He thinks he's not going to find any. But then when he asks for the name, a clear, strong male voice seems to correct the spelling, saying not Ahmed, but Adam. Fuck. Anthony and Heather stare at each other, stunned. And then suddenly, Heather just kind of screams and grabs her side, saying, Ah! My side's burning! She runs to Anthony's bathroom, comes back a few moments later. Would you look at this, she asks, if she, as she lifts up her shirt. There's a long, red, angry gash on her right side. Oh. The side Harold was sitting closest to. It starts from the middle of her belly, curves around to the middle of her back, like something had cut her. What the fuck? Anthony's finally freaked out himself now. Oh, finally. This thing has attacked at least two people. He puts Harold in a storage locker in Denver. That was 2005, one year after Anthony won the doll on eBay and he would keep it locked away out of the public eye for the next eight years. Then in May of 2013, Anthony gets curious again, retrieves Harold from the storage unit. He'd met a woman named Maria who did object readings. Fucking, I hate this guy. And he has uh, this uh, Maria examine Harold. And when Maria holds the doll, she says, I see a girl who owned this doll when she was around 10 years old. She has long hair tied in the back with a bow. And then, uh, and that was all Maria could find out. Just a little girl around 10. Oh no. Anthony takes Harold to another psychic, a woman named Erica, who says, I'm picking up a male energy. She gives Anthony much more details. She tells Anthony that a young man was also part of the doll. It, it was like he was trapped inside of the doll. The, the little girl Maria had sensed before uh, was his sister, his half-sister. They had the same father but different mothers. They lived on a plantation somewhere in the south. Okay. Erica said that the girl was loved by her older brother that she tagged along with him everywhere he went. They were inseparable. She talked about seeing a river running through the plantation grounds. There was a tire swing that hung from a tree next to the water, and one of the girl's favorite things to do was sit in it while her brother pushed her out over the water. And then one day, when he was pushing her, the little girl fell out of the swing. She drowned. Oh. She, yep, and her half-brother half was blamed for it. And she loved her doll so much that she somehow ended up inside of it. And in his grief over her death, her brother took his own life. Oh, my God. And ended up inside of it as well. This uh, Erica thinks that uh, maybe something inside the doll tricked them into joining it. Was it this pedophile spirit? Was that spirit even the spirit of a person? Was it a demon? The psychic wouldn't say. She suddenly didn't want to hold the doll any longer. So what now? Anthony believes that multiple spirits are attached to Harold. And that perhaps... Two of those spirits, you know, the spirits of these children, possibly other spirits, are being tormented by the dark soul or some kind of dark entity who may have tormented children in life, now certainly torments children in death. He continues to possess the doll to this day because he hopes that he can somehow release the souls of those two children. Anthony does not feel safe around Harold. He claims the doll has physically attacked him, left bruises and scratches numerous times. He says that he's constantly under attack from this doll. Will he ever be able to free those two children? Are there spirits even inside the doll? Is any spirit inside the doll? 
Is it all infested not with the souls of those who once walked the earth, or is it possessed by something or several somethings much more sinister? Entities that confuse and manipulate anyone who tries to examine the doll? And what happens to the doll if something happens to Anthony? Could it end up back on another flea market? Could it end up on some other online auction? Could you end up with it? And if you did end up with it, how long would you keep it? Fucking not one second. Yeek. Ooh. So doing this story. Yeah, tell me what happened This is last the one night. that freaked me out. Well, let's look at this picture because the picture of this doll, and, and it doesn't look that, this is the first picture of the doll. Oh. Right? Doesn't seem like that big of a deal. And then here's the next picture of the same doll. When I'm looking at these pictures, I don't know why, because it, it came out of nowhere. I'm working on my desk here in this oh, office last one night. eye. And, and, and I just got so cold. I got super, like the super I got, chills. I got super cold when you were telling this story. It, 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 like it, it, I was, it, I was going to reach over and look uh, at the thermometer, but I it, didn't. It just weirded me out and it weirded me out unexpectedly because I'm like, you know, I mean, this guy, Anthony, you can actually find him online and it's a weird thing with this story for me because he seems like a little bit of a nut to me. It's like, he's a guy that I wouldn't want to believe. I'm like, get out of here. You know, uh, I will say the source material, not to like put him down, but Holy shit, this guy is a terrible author. Right, like, it's just like poorly oh, written. Oh my God. Like really, in my opinion, really poorly written. Like really hard to kind of pull the story together. Okay. And so I'm kind of like annoyed mm-hmm. as I'm putting the story together to tell him, like, dude, like what? A-. But also I kept getting unexpectedly so freaked out that for the first time in any of the stories I've done here, I just left the office. I know, you came home like rattled. And as I'm leaving the office, I, I, I felt like so cold that my chills, my goosebumps wouldn't go away. And then, <laughs> and then I feel like a crazy person. I'm like, I must just be tired. It felt like something followed me out of the fucking office. I'm just like, Ugh! I, I, like I, I wouldn't look back in the hallway. I went quickly to my truck, just you know, shut the door, turn Why on. Why did you call me? I don't know. I just, I, I, cause you know, that would have taken extra time. I just wanted to get out of there as fast okay, as possible. Okay, okay. Then I come home. You and I joke about it. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. I was teasing you hard. Yeah. You, you teased me. Because I think that these things are real. I know. And, and I don't want to. Right. And, and I'm joking about that. And then I'm like, like you're freaked out. So I'm like, yes. I'm like, um, then I try to talk you into sleeping on the couch. Yeah. Last so night. I can work by you. Yeah. He was like, I, I, I'll turn off all the lights. I'm like, okay, I'll put my sleep mask on. Right. Like, he's like, okay, I'll, I just he did not want to be alone. And then I was like, babe, I don't think I can fucking sleep on my couch. Can I please go to bed? And you were like, okay, I'll, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. Yep. And then, and then when I was working on it, I was like, you know what? I'm going to push past. I'm gonna, I, I turn off all the lights. Oh my God. Why? I, cause I, cause I hate being annoyed by this stuff or being like, feel like I'm freaked out. I sat in the chair, started working on it, had my back towards the stairs. Oh, so my back is towards the darkness. Fucking idiot. And I'm like, I'm like, fuck you, Harold. I'm like, I'm not going to get, you know, uh, freaked out. And it just, I got the biggest creeps all over again. And I, and then I felt it from like the, the bathroom upstairs. I just felt like a weird, I'm like, what is going on? I ended up just turning all the lights on. I almost like stopped just to get up early in the morning and keep working on it. I did finish it, but it was like through just willpower of like, no, no, I don't want to be freaked out. But I, but I was freaked out the entire night working on that story. Well, welcome to how it feels in our house for me. Yikes. That's how it feels pretty much all the time. I get it now. I get yeah, it. Spooky. There, well, yeah, I mean, I do genuinely think there is something in our house. And yeah, it, but, yeah. I don't, but I don't think that it's bad. Right. Right. But. It, when you're scared, yeah. it doesn't matter if it's good or bad. It just doesn't feel, you just feel right. totally freaked out. You yeah. should have got me up. We could have like burned some sage. I'll teach you all the things. Put all salt right. on the door. I, I don't know if I'm ready to go there yet, but oh, but, but, but wow. more stories like this, I will be. Yeah. Let's get, and, and I have some more pictures, okay. more doll pictures. This, uh, this next one, this is the <laughs> doll that scared me as a kid. That's Chucky from Child's Play. <laughs> yeah. And then these next two, I don't know where they're from. They are just creepy as shit. Okay. Here's this next one. Ooh. Don't how, like that. How would you like to have that doll in the house? Nope. No, thank you. And then now we got a little uh, cluster of them in this next picture. No, okay. thank you. Nope. Yeah. I'm... Those are those composition dolls. No, thank you. Well, there's a composition doll behind you. Yikes. I make a look. <laughs> I think, well, I get nervous because I bought them at a flea markety thing. Oh, my God. But yeah. it did. Joe and I, before we started this podcast, Joe and I went to the, like the Paris flea market on 4th Street oh, and yeah. just bought a handful of things for the studio to give it the good creep yep, factor. Yeah, here in And uh, yeah, we bought this doll. And I, he actually, I mean, he's very, very, very Oh, del- I, I forgot about him. I don't like him at all. I don't, can we get him on camera? Be careful. He's nope. very delicate. No, I don't want to touch him. Not not right now. Okay, I'll come grab him. Okay, Joe, you okay, can Joe, do it. Okay, Joe, 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 Joe our producer, is going to come grab the doll. 
His little, he I, just after the know, Herald story, he looks too much like that. Joe, you know, like his one arm is broken off and the sawdust yeah, yeah, yeah. comes we're out. Just, That's why he's in this bowl. Okay. And we had, we actually had to buy him in this bowl that I didn't even want. Yeek. <laughs> he is we, creepy. Remember how long we researched him? Yeah, we kept trying to find him, exactly like, God, because God. careful, careful, careful. Gentle. Hey, buddy, I'm being nice to you, buddy. But he, um, he had some sort of marking, like oh, a- fun. Like no 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 like from like the manufacturer oh. and so Joe and I spent a lot of time trying to figure out where he came from. Joe, did what did we ever decide? Germany maybe? Yeah, there was a, a Ooh, bunch see? of markings that kind of. Oh, buddy, sorry, oh buddy. gosh, dang! Now you pulled out Dan? his insides. I know, Dan, I know he's. Oh boy, I know he's, he's very, very delicate. fragile oh, and, he, and he won't stay up. Okay. Well, he, he doesn't, doesn't he, like to sit and, up. And these these little candles are not uh, able to. God dang it. Okay, well, just, that's, just that's throw him. Sit. Make fun that, of him while you hold him. Cool. So now he's help. staring at me. Yep. Okay. Well, that, uh, he hey, has buddy. to remain there because I can't move him. Oh my god. But yeah. But but when you were talking about composition, I was like, oh, that I never mm -hmm. knew that that's what that was called. So, oh god, his eyes are like, yeek. Oh my god, <sighs> buddy. So did you get any sleep? Yeah. Once I went to the once I went to bed, I was I was so tired. I was okay, okay. but I was freaked out the whole time I was awake. Okay. So I had several drinks. <laughs> I get it. I got it. This show makes me drink a lot as well. Um, sorry, I just went somewhere in my head. Um, but I, okay, so we were just in Denver mm -hmm. and we were just by Cherry Creek. Mm -hmm. So I was having a lot of like, oh my God, oh my God. Because when we were like a little update about me, just like since we're in this space, when we were in Denver, I was certain that I saw yeah. something in the condo that we were staying at. Right, I right. was really certain there was something there with me. Or I was just a little too high. Ha! <laughs> Right, right, which I think is sort of a thing. Like when I get a little bit high, because this happened at home this past week. Yeah, I took the tiniest bit, like yeah. half a milligram, microgram, whatever, right. however it's measured. I mean, the tiniest bit, and it opens up something in me, whether it just allows me to be more imaginative or yeah. uh, less guarded. But every time I'm high, I'm like, oh, it's here. So. Maybe, maybe it's always there and that allows me to be open to it or maybe it's just my imagination getting the best of me. Maybe, maybe. What do you think would happen if you, I was going to say Robert the doll, what uh, What do you think would happen if you got Harold? Oh, I don't want to get Harold. I don't know. I don't know. Something creepy. I th do you think he killed those people? I don't I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things where I don't want to believe it. I'm like, no, right. come on. A doll can't kill somebody. But at the same time, after hearing that story, I don't want that fucking doll near me. Right. No. So part of, part of me is, you know, uh, a little less skeptical, I guess. Do you want to hold my hand cross or no, my- No, I, I got my little squishy guy. Um, St. Michael? Nope. I got my squishy guy for the story. A little squishy skull guy. Somewhere. Somebody sent, sent me a St. Michael charm. Oh, there it is. Ah, perfect. Okay. Okay, you ready to scare me? I am ready to scare you. And I think that this story is terrifying. Okay. Like truly, whoa, buddy. Here we go. That's a big one. Okay. Okay. Here we go. First of all, I want to say I love the podcast. Thank you. I'm from Idaho, so okay. I love the Idaho references. 17 years ago, I was a stay-at-home mom taking care of a five-year-old and a three-year-old. We lived in a religious house, and my then-husband was a pastor with a pictorial degree through BBC. My three-year-old would have these nightmares every night. She would wake up, pointing to the corner in her room where her dollhouse was, screaming, no, no, no. We prayed over her and our entire house. We realized that the dollhouse had been given to us by atheists. And at the time, my belief, along with my husband's, was that atheists, although being nice, they bring in evil and darkness. Oh, man, come on. So, listen, they were super religious. Okay. So, we also got rid of the dollhouse during the cleansing of the house. Great. More dolls. Dollhouse. <laughs> Eep. Despite the cleansing of the house, the next morning at the breakfast table, my five-year-old daughter told us there was a man in the house last night. What? No alarms had gone off. We didn't hear anyone. My husband exclaimed that she must just have a wild imagination and that clearly she was dreaming. Relentless, she continued, Mommy, Mommy. There was a man. He was here. And so we listened to her story. She told us that the man was tall and he glowed a bright glow. He did not speak with his mouth and yet she could still hear him. Ah. She told us that he would only wake her and that the rest of the household would be safe. She then explained that he hugged her and what? then walked into the hallway. 
She said, Mommy, he was so tall, he had to bend down to go through my doorway. Mommy, he hit his head on the hall light and made it shake. Oh, I said, and then I asked, and then what did he do? Thinking I was just feeding into a wild imaginative story from a five-year-old. We hadn't heard anything in the house, and the way she described it, we should have heard it too. He went into Beth's room, my daughter said. Oh, what did he do? I asked. My daughter explained that he bent down and kissed Beth. Ah. That the dark, tall man had breathed on her with air that she could see and told her she would no longer be plagued by nightmares. Wow, I said, what a relief. (laughs) I thought she was done, but my daughter continued, Mommy. Then he went downstairs into yours and daddy's room. He touched your belly and said, I would have a brother, but that you would get sick. He said that you would live. He kissed you. Then he told me that daddy is evil. And no matter what evil comes into this house, God will protect us. And then, Mommy, he vanished into a ball into the ceiling. Later that day... It's a very specific story. Oh, yeah. It gets better. Later that day, I was putting clothes away in the bedrooms, and I looked up at the hallway light. It hung from a hook on three chains, those old-fashioned lights. Mm. Two of the three chains were off the hook, like a tall man had hit it and shook it loose. A year later, I became pregnant. At 30 weeks, I gave birth to a baby boy who then passed away. The cause of early labor was a tumor in my uterus. The prophecy my daughter shared with us a year earlier was coming to light. I fought the cancer and survived, however, at a great cost. My then husband became angry all of the time. It was as if he blamed me for the death of our son. The house began to take on a different feeling, like it had a life of its own. Cupboards would open, objects would move. It always felt as if someone was watching me. I felt I was being watched in the shower, and that made me especially uneasy. There was always the sound of children at night playing in our movie room, the sound of balls being thrown against the wall, and footsteps going up and down the stairs. At times, I could hear the projector being turned on. No amount of prayer seemed to be able to stop it. Then one day, my ex-husband hit me. Oh, jeez. His eyes had gone dark, and I could tell it wasn't him. We had never believed that a demon could take over the mind of a believer in Christ, but I know this man before me was not my husband. We prayed and we prayed, but it did no good. My husband continued to beat me every day. Jesus. I felt forced to stay silent about everything that happened in our home. We never aired our dirty laundry, and a pastor who beat his wife, it seemed like the worst scenario. Who would believe me? One night, I woke up choking on my own spit. As I looked up, there was a black entity on top of me. I could not move. Immobilized, I tried to spit out what I was choking on, trying to scream as I felt cold hands on my neck. It was as if I was being choked and paralyzed simultaneously by this thing on top of me. And then I felt my chest being pounded and then poof, the black thing disappeared off my chest. In that instant, I felt the pain go away as if someone had been giving me CPR. A ball of light was floating above me. That Sunday, we had a prophetess from Washington visit our church. As a family, we went to get prophesized. She flat out refused. She looked at me and said, evil awaits you at home what i knew that my ex in his grief over our son who had died had become dark and evil and was now a threat to our family through prayer i endured the nightly hauntings in our house then one day i was at the grocery store when a random stranger handed me a check she said i do not know you but god does he says leave the evil so i am giving you a way out She gave me a check for $5,000. What? I never cashed it. In fact, I still have it as a reminder that evil comes in so many forms, including pastors. On the way home, I could feel the dread of my house, my ex, and how the evil had consumed my life. My children were being haunted nightly with nightmares. It was time that I speak up. As we came around the corner to our street, my youngest started to cry, Mommy, dark! Mommy, dark! My oldest told me that there was a killer waiting at home to hurt us. Pulling into our driveway, the garage door would not go up. A darkness that I can only describe as an empty abyss consumed our house. Walking through the front door, the lights would not turn on. The three of us saw two giant red glowing eyes and heard heavy growling and breathing. As the eyes darted toward us, I started to recite a prayer. I yelled, this is the house of God, be gone. It disappeared going right 
through us. My oldest looked at me screaming and crying. See, mommy, Michael warned you about daddy being evil. Oh my God, I was freaking out. That night as I was packing, I felt a heavy breathing across the back of my neck. A voice growled deeply in my ear, you will never escape. I whipped my head around to meet the eyes of my ex-husband, his voice animal-like, a knife in his hand. Oh my God. I did escape and with my children, but not without my throat being slit and what? stab wounds all over my body. I fought with all of the fight in me. I fought every slash and stab, eight of them to be exact. My ex is in prison and he is claiming insanity. What, what the fuck? Was he possessed? He may have been. Do I still believe in God? I do believe in good and evil and that no matter what your religion of choice is, you can be plagued by both. My oldest is now 22 years old and to this day she will tell me about Michael, the angel. She still sees ghosts regularly, regularly and will often talk to them. She has also told me she has never again seen an angel, but she knows they watch over us. She has a sixth sense, and through her, I have learned that there are bad and good spirits everywhere. Always, Frankie. Oh my God. So at one point, I'm reading the story, and I'm like, is this a joke? Like, I know, that's what I'm, I'm like. I'm like, is this, per- what the hell? But then when we got to the prison part, I was like, well, I could obviously research this and figure this out. Like, that is such a specific detail right. that he is in prison. Claiming insanity. Oh, my God. Isn't that crazy? That is so crazy. So crazy. That she was actually assaulted. Yeah. And, and you know, just because, I mean, I think that this is important to their story, but, I mean, they were God-fearing, God-loving people, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it was such a core part mm-hmm. of their life. And I get why she would think, like, well, if you just believe in the good, the evil right. can't get you. But clearly... Maybe he didn't believe hard enough or something. I don't know. I don't know. But that whatever whatever that happened, that is terrifying. Terrifying. So, Frankie, we're glad you and your kids are okay. And, yeah, I mean, I guess we just, I mean, I don't know. I hope your husband makes peace with what happened. I don't, I don't know what you say to that. Yeah, I don't either. Uh, thanks for sharing that story with us. Very dramatic. Very dramatic. That, that definitely had me on the edge of my seat. Yeah, it was, it was a, a good one. Um, and so with all the heaviness, yeah. I thought, I got this email last night, very last minute, and I thought this would be a really lovely, oh, fun yeah, way. Oh, yeah, I you mentioning this last yeah. time we were sitting there. I just, when you I know, was freaked out, you're like, well, I have a nice story, too. Yeah, and I just, um, I didn't think that when we started doing this podcast, we would ever get this kind of email, so yeah. it's super fun. I remember and, it made you super happy. Yeah, it did. Uh, so the email goes, hey, Lindsay and Dan, I know that you get so many stories that end up freaking you out. So I just wanted to share some wholesome content with you. Scared to Death has come to mean so much to me for the short time it's been running. It has made a positive impact on my well-being, and I hope sharing this story makes your hearts warm as mine as when I watch Scared to Death. This is JT, Sean, and me. Uh, There was a picture included of three friends. Oh, okay. We were all friends already, but we weren't brought together as a threesome until senior year of high school in 2013. That makes me feel very old. <laughs> Youngins, good for you. I know, I love it. We found that the three of us had so much in common. Our uh-huh. birthdays are even April 27th, 28th, and 29th. But above all, our love for Halloween solidified our friendship. We assembled ourselves, I'm sorry, we assembled ourselves as the spook squad. Ha! Huh? We spend every Halloween together planning all sorts of ghoulish activities. Creeps. Haunted, mm-hmm. Haunted houses, scary movies, graveyard, graveyard visits, jack o lantern festern. I can't speak today. Jack O' Lantern festivals, yeah. haunted hay rides, creepy pastas. Every year oh, is yeah. simply a spooktacular we cherish every ghostly day of the month. Typically, after October, we disband until the next year. We keep in touch, but we don't see each other nearly as much until we do the harvest. For the past two Halloweens, our firstborn brother, Sean, has been residing in New York. JT and I still live in a little farm town in Illinois. October 2018 was very much not the same. JT and I did not see as much of each other as usual as the first year without Sean. October is usually my bliss before my seasonal depression kicks in Mm. on November 1st, so I was a little bummed out. We had not adopted adapted the loss of our friend and did not fully embrace the festivities. My seasonal depression had begun to become crippling as usual for the past five years. And as my boyfriend at the time was an immense lover of the Christmas season, so was his love for the holidays that made things a little bit easier for me. I was beginning to enjoy Christmas again when this past February, he left me for another woman Uh. five years into our relationship 
three months into our new 12 year lease, which <sighs> if you ever, ever had to break a lease, you know how frustrating that is. Wait, 12 month lease. Yeah. Three months into their 12 month lease. Oh yeah. 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 Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. And he's, and said he only stayed with me because he had no place to go. Anyways, long story short, I'm back to having intense seasonal depression for all the uh. reasons I already said, plus a reminder of my disgusting ex and all of the Christmas memories we shared together. So good part. Luckily, 2019 with JT was the best October yet. It was jam-packed with so many hauntingly extraordinary activities, including watching a new series called Scared to Death. <laughs> JT had been a fan of dance comedy for years, so when he heard that you guys announced the show, he was thrilled. We made an evening out of it every Friday night in October. We got our snacks and our blankets, lit our candelabra, and began your podcast. We had a new tradition, and it really brought us closer, Aww. which has warmed my soul. As I said, typically after October, we disband, always making a joke after spending Halloween night together. See you next year. But I suggested maybe we should keep meeting up once a week to continue watching Dan and Lindsay scare the pants off each other. And he agreed he wouldn't watch it without me. Ah. And so here we are. We have formed a friendship outside of October. And now I have a really amazing outlet for my seasonal depression that I look forward to every week. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for creating this amazing, spooky, fun show for all of us. I know sometimes it takes a toll on your sanity, <laughs> and if you ever needed to stop the show, we would understand. But for now, I hope it continues for a very long run. Happy belated birthday, with the warmest regards and a loyal creep, Lynn. Ah, uh, thanks, Lynn. Isn't that, cute? that is nice. That's sweet. I love that. That was nice to hear. Nice uh, some palate s- cleanser. A mm, little bit of a palate cleanser. I mean, my I'm, God. I, I, I can tell that Harold is gonna fuck. Har- oh uh, no, not not fuck Harold. Uh, I can tell that that story is gonna stick with me for a little while. Like, I, I keep flashing on it, even as I'm listening to other things. I'm just like, why? Why is that bothering me? Uh, Because there's a composite doll on our no, I desk? Don't, I don't get a weird feeling from him. I, just, I know, I didn't either, and I touched him a lot. Yeah, yeah, and he looks creepy, but it, but it's something about, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Well, also, I mean, <sighs> somebody, I don't want to, like, call out, but somebody told us that there is a spirit in this building. Have, I know, I know. I don't like to think about that, that either. Well. We think it's just like a nice little old lady who's lost. Well, don't go into the doll. Don't go into any of the dolls. Don't make dolls' eyes move. <laughs> I can't stop staring at it. When you were telling that story, I kept like, Ugh. so if I look distracted during this second story that Dan told me, it's because I was watching the doll. I was doing like a... That'd be the worst. That'd be the worst to be looking at one of those things and have their eyes just like, whoop, just look at you oh like for God. sure. Oh, I would jump out of my skin. I had so many chills during Harold. Harold is creepy creepy and also i just don't like that um what's his name adam anthony anthony i don't like that anthony still has him just fucking burn the doll wouldn't that well, release that, the remember spirits th- inside the one guy tried remember the supposed well, supposedly try again i don't know don't be don't such know. a weenie <laughs> Kid, like really douse it yeah go for it anthony it was not our problem yeah it's, 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 send us video it's, it's yeah maybe well yeah it's, if he can live if the doll doesn't kill him for trying to burn him the doll's not gonna kill him if the go, doll itself is dead you, Maybe he can't kill a doll, though. Maybe if he tries to burn it, the doll will defend itself. Well, Give I want to Give him a brain aneurysm happen. or something. Oh, my God. Can you imagine if he tried to kill the doll and then he just fell over dead? Like, I mean... Like the cat? If that happens, I want video. <laughs> <laughs> Pixar didn't happen. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's all for today. Uh, <laughs> please keep sending your stories to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Man, they are getting creepy and scary. They're really good. Uh, for everything else, like that last story, please uh, email us at info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Uh, thanks for listening or watching uh, a, scared to de- uh, a Bad Magic production, Scared to Death Podcast. Uh, thanks to the Bad Magic Productions team. Harmony Camp on social media. Joe Paisley producing and directing. Zach Flannery, part of our team here as well. Uh, thanks to Joe Paisley, Zach Cohen, Jeffrey Montoya for the sound beds. Thanks to Heather Rylander for taking over the My Story at Scared to Death podcast.com email so Lindsay can sleep. Thank you. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram for, you know, more little glimpses into our little scaredy life here uh-huh. uh, at Scared to Death Podcast. Subscribe on YouTube. Enjoy your nightmares, creeps, and peepers. Hope you were scared to death and do not touch Harold if you ever get the chance. Correct. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through but has no home here within scared to death.